Richard invited me to speak um, uh, about strangers from the deep and it's very good for an artist I think to have to try and talk about the work in a different context so I hope tonight for those of you who know the work and have heard me speak before I might speak about it in a new way and I'm going to try and show some new works which people from Boston mightn't have seen before so it's not all the same stuff the older you get the harder it is to speak about your work because there's too much to speak about and it's very very diff it, it gets more difficult actually so forgive me if I rattle on and sound repetitive but I hope that the strange notion will make me consider it in a different way because a lot of people think my work is strange I don't because it becomes terribly familiar but um, it's an interesting territory um, could you show the first video thanks very much I'm going to just show you the first two minutes of, of the um, documentary called about beauty When you're diving, especially in, in blue water, there's a fantastic thing that occurs depending on visibility, where shark come through the, the blue towards you, and very often they investigate you and, and depart. But there's this point of blue perception where you're not sure you see it or not, where the blues merge, and it's a fantastic point where Imagination and reality merge. And that's something that I think epitomizes visual art in a way. Beauty is uncertainty. So I'm beginning with an old piece of work, which was um, an untitled photograph I made um, where I inset a fetal skeleton into the brain space of a human skull. And when Richard invited me to talk about that notion of the, the you know, strangeness <coughs> from the depths, in, in some sense, the strangest thing is our own existence. And for me, this piece kind of sums up that in, 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 a, in, in a bodily way. Um, you know, we, we come in terms of our own body and then we come in terms of our own mind. And um, this is a, a self-portrait I did when I was about, uh, maybe about 25 years ago. And I was looking at it when I was going through my files and realizing that it is about a kind of, a, it's, a, it's about a, an intellectual notion of striving. But it's also overlaid with, it's in fact a dogfish, not a shark. But the, it's, it shows the kind of futility and problematic um, human attempt to strive towards something which in some sense is animal but the dogfish actually if you look closely I was thinking about this the other day is tied by a string to the wall so it is all about limitations and the thing I feel very much in terms of visual art is that we are incredibly limited so when something sparks in the brain that is new and surprising and essentially strange. That is the kernel and the crystal that creates art or some process towards trying to transform something or present something in a new way. Um, I just brought some slides of where I live. Um, um, I was brought up in the south of Ireland in Cork, but I, about seven years ago I, I moved from Dublin to live in the west coast. And this is the end of my land that I go to every morning and I work just, you know, about 100 yards up the, up the field. And this, in some ways, explains a lot of my new work because my territory are these beaches that I walk on and I find stuff and I bring it back and uh, sometimes use it in, in art. And this is a carcass of a, a Cuvier's well that I found that had, was very decayed. And generally, when they land on a beach, they, they um, get removed by the county council because they smell too bad and people think it's uh, inappropriate to have a smelly thing on a beach. So I got to this earlier than the council and got my farmer neighbour to carry it up to my land. <laughs> but I, I'm just showing this because in, you know, the neighbours behind the hedges, they were, you know, they were going, John has a new digger and John has a whale on his new digger. It was this very strange kind of half 
watchful um, journey for three miles up to my field. But what I love about it is it, it's kind of, it's a material that is, is, is pure nature. It's, it was really disgusting. It took a year to decay. I put it down on my cliff and the birds didn't even eat it. It was so disgusting. But I knew that the prevailing winds would blow the smell out to sea and that nobody would complain and it was far enough from the road. But wh what I generally do with the, the kind of discovery of something is... Um, try to relocate it or re reconfigure. And this is a little girl called Lara who lives down the road. And she's a wise child. And um, very, you know, she doesn't question. I said, Lara, will you hold that whalebone and I'll take some photographs? And she holds a whalebone. And it, it, what I love about it is that the kind of innocence and ancient quality between the two things. And photography is a fantastically fast tool for that type of endeavor. We're jumping back to 1988 now, and this was a show I did in the Douglas Hyde in Trinity College in Dublin, and it was called Ebb, and it was the first kind of major show I was given um, to do, and it's a, a wonderful space that you enter in from above. And these characters, I refer to them as characters, were all kind of invaded by oceanic kind of um, elements, fish elements, like a shark fin or a shark lady in a ball dress. And looking back at it now, it was very much, I had just read uh, John Updike's Couples and I loved it. And I was trying to kind of re-enact some notion of the human relationships, like going to a cocktail party, and some kind of strangeness that was very much a construction. In those days, I spent hours and hours and hours building these things out of thin plywood and um, making a kind of a theatre that you, the, the, the viewer entered down this little pier and kind of mingled with the structures. But it was very much about the notion of the removal of water, seeing something for a short period of time, and then possibly the tide coming in again. So maybe the relationships of all those sculptures would be different the next day. Um, and this, this was a trip I made last year to an island in the South Pacific called New Ireland. And it was a, a, a tantalus, really. I, I heard of the name of the island and thought how fantastic and how abominable at the same time, colonization and, uh, and naming. It was named by a, a British captain who sailed down there in the 17th century. He said, that's New Ireland, that's New Britain, that's New Hanover, and he sailed past. And at the same time, I heard of a practice called shark calling that the natives on the island um, believe that their ancestors, through ritual, song, and will guide them to the shark and, the, and guide the shark to them. They go out in these dugout canoes, they use rattles and song, and they lure the sharks up from the depths. And it actually works. You know, it's very, very deep off these islands. And um, it's a very male practice, but I went there to try and film them. And this is a man called Shogang, who is a younger shark caller. He's, he's about 37, and he's probably the last of the village who believe in the ritual of it. There are one or two men who think it's going to be tourism, but only one tourist had ever visited the village in the year previous to us getting there. There are no roads, there's no running water, there's no electricity, there's, no, there's nothing. It's, 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 to my mind, being a Western person, a treasure of a place that's just on the brink of having a road built to the other side of the island, which will change it enormously. But... What I felt about the place, and this man is called Selam Karasambe, and he was filmed by Cousteau in the 80s, and by an, uh, an Australian man. And I had researched films about him and seen him as a young man, and when I arrived in the village, he was still there, but he had been excluded by the young men. But I immediately went up to him. They speak English because they were colonised. And um, he had been almost kind of put, put aside, but... He was, he's a real magic man and is, is the heart of this fantastic place where they live between ocean and garden. And it's literally that. They grow their vegetables up in the jungle and they fish on, on the reef. So I spent most of my time with him. And in a moment I'll show you the piece of work that we made from it. But just to fill you in a little bit of, of, of the place, you know, the girls would bring me these flying foxes for dinner. And um, they shot them with um, little you know, um, catapults. And it, this was a woman who peeled her potatoes with a, with a beautiful shell. It was, it was just, it was such a fantastically open place. You arrived and they sang on the reefs. 
Um, they sang in harmony. You thought, where's the movie camera? Where's Marlon Brando? You know, all that kind of cynicism and, um, and kind of presumption of, 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 you know, of us from the West was with us. But then when you go out three miles offshore, Selam allowed me go in his canoe, uh, but he, he gave me leaves from the jungle that I had to wash my body with uh, the night at dawn before going out because women bring bad luck to the sharks. And in fact, we didn't catch a shark. And I said to him, is it because I was in the canoe? And he said, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but, uh, but this was the, be the beauty uh, and, uh, and strangeness. But the kind of daily existence of this, like he took his t-shirt and put it on his head. You're talking Vogue magazine meets, you know, the most primitive kind of considered thing in the world, um, which is a kind of a, a natural, it's, 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 it's a natural art, which I'll speak about later in terms of a visit to the Galapagos. But there, there's a, there's a, they eat beetle nuts in between catching a shark. He's having his beetle nut and he's going back into land. Um, Ritesh, could you show the, the video now? There's, I'm just going to show you one section of video, which will make sense in a minute when I show you the next show, of a man called of Salam singing a song. Uh, what I did was I asked him, could I interview him? And then he started to sing the song. And you see what happens. Bali <laughs> Lino mano su Balama Ay balama Rangit niya Uben kakano No it's heartbreaking to watch that, but basically what Salam was doing, he sang that song to camera. I saw that he was beginning to cry, and I gestured would I stop filming and he, he, he put his hand up and he wanted to sing this song. What a, this is a song he normally sang when he was out at sea and he had caught a shark and it was a, a song of thanks to the shark and to his ancestors and he had never ever f sung it on land before or ever to anybody before and I, I said why are you crying and he said I believe the whole cycle and natural process of shark calling is dying, the ritual of shark calling. And for me, I felt it was, it was he wanted to, to mark that sadness because he knows that life is changing and that this, this kind of balance that exists in his life is going, is, will be gone for the next generation. But what we do as tourists is, is, is think this is strange that people go out and use rattles and, and catch a shark. But what I love is that is this, uh, that it's a normality at the same time. And that closeness to nature, which Robin spoke about so beautifully earlier, and I wish I could speak so beautifully about, is essentially what life is about in a way. So when I came back to Ireland, um, I, I made a show in the gallery, a show in Dublin called the Curlin Gallery. And I called it Sapiens or Sapiens, which is the root of Homo Sapiens, which comes from the word wisdom in Latin, sapiens. And it's always a kind of vaguely amused me and, and disgusted me that we've had, had the arrogance to call ourselves wise. Um, so I was trying to look at that notion in relationship to this show. And uh, this piece was called Sapiens itself. And it's a cast of a human skull in bronze. And growing out of the back of the head is a little fetal skeleton cast in bronze also. And it ties in a bit with the first image you saw of, of, of the skeleton in, in the brain space. Because in some sense, it's about, it's a, about a potential 
rebirthing. It's about no, uh, the uh, idea, it, it's about imagination and creativity, but it's also about death, which is inherent in all of that. And putting it on the tripod in a way, in terms of kind of speculative vision or whatever, or an instrument of um, discovery was kind of important. And in the gallery, we projected Selam on the far wall, and above it, I found this boat. This is a traditional Irish boat called a curragh, and um, I found it on the beach in parts, and I dragged it back to the studio and then rebuilt it. And I left it fractured between bow and stern. And I also found this perfect bird, a gannet, on the beach, very unfortunately for the gannets. They, um, they fly very high and they dive for fish in the sea, and, and sometimes the, the sea is too shallow and they can't judge it, and they break their necks. And I found him in very perfect um, fettle, and a man in County Sligo stuffed him for me. And we had him flying up, uh, we, turned, we inverted the curragh and had it upside down in the, in the gallery, and then underneath it is the bird flying upside down. So it's a kind of a, it's the notion of the fractured culture of Ireland, which in some ways too is not dissimilar to anywhere in that people are becoming more removed from the ocean. This connects back to a piece I'll show you later called Teacup, but also nature is upside down. So what you're having in terms of um, Salem's fracture and sadness around his ritual is in some ways been mirrored in this piece, which is to do in some sense with, with Ireland. Because wisdom, is so tied in to, to nature, in some sense. It, it's, it's, it, it is nature. And another piece in the, in the corner, this was called Forge, and it was the same set of skulls, but with the fetal skeleton just in a different position, on this old anvil. And it's something that always interests me in terms of determined uh, condition, or the choices we make in life, how they, we forge them for ourselves, they are forged for us, whether it's genetic, whether it's, uh, you know, financial, whatever it is that drives us through in a way that makes us live in a certain way. That, you know, comes from the animal in us, but also comes from the imagination in us. Um, but also, in, in the, you know, even Laos mentioning the goth, you know, I, one is very conscious of using a skull in, in, in any form, a human skull, because of Halloween, etc. But um, it's terribly important, I think, more and more to try and look at one's own re relationship with death, I guess, and uh, our own uh, structure, our own kind of, um, cr you know, like looking at our skeleton in terms of our life. And it's not necessarily negative. It's about, you know, in terms of the forging, it's about potential somehow more than a negativity. And these pieces, this is, these are more, more poetic. Um, where, where my land is, uh, foxgloves grow wild in the springtime, and they're beautiful big purple flowers. And what I, I made a, 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 a piece in Dia a couple of years ago based on the notion of the foxglove. And in mythology, you, uh, you, they were known as witches' fingers. And when we were kids, we were told you should never stick your fingers into a foxglove and lick, lick them because you would go blind. And in fact, there's a, a semi-truth in that, in that there's digitalis in a foxglove, which is used as a heart medicine. And if you are given too much digitalis, you can start seeing in primary colours, blues and yellows. But in this particular case, I cast the tips of so a set of five fingers, and you can see here, they read as the bells of the foxgloves. And very, very often people don't see the fingers at all, actually, which is kind of nice. But they're very, very hard to cast. It's back into sky. It's a love. You, you have to dip them into the wax so that it's not too thick and it's not too thin. You don't shrivel the foxglove and you don't make it too lumpy. And then the actual flower is burnt out in the lost wax process in the foundry. So you only have one flower. There's no such thing as a mold or anything else. And this piece was a guillemot. It's a seabird that unfortunately died too. I, 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 my, my, uh, one kid came into my studio one day and said, everything's dead in here. <laughs> and she was right, actually. But um, uh, what I, I, I kind of think in some ways it's some kind of, um, you know, uh, giving them a, a second chance, a bit like the cow's udders in the old days. But this piece is a music stand that I found in a junk shop. And w another thing I always find in terms of nature and culture, and I recently made a trip to the Galapagos Islands with my friend Fiona Shaw, who's an actor, and I was sent by the Gulbenkian to make a piece of work about being there. And it was one of the most difficult things I ever did in my life. And we both came to the conclusion that you shouldn't. 
in some sense, you shouldn't make art about the Galapagos. The Galapagos is this strange little um, island of extraordinary, intense nature that's been destroyed very rapidly by us humans. And um, it's, 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 it felt to both of us that it was inappropriate to, to create. We used what was there in our final piece, but we didn't try and make anything new from it in a funny way. But what this is doing is challenging the notion of the human attempt to make music, because you look at a bird and they're extraordinary, and nothing in some ways can be more extraordinary than, than, than nature. But this poor fellow is pinioned into the music stand. And this one was a, a little movie screen that my father used to show us uh, home movies on, with a gannet fl flying up in, in front of it. <coughs> um, in the same show of Sapiens, I, went, I used photographs to do with the relationship between the human and the animal, like little Lara with the whalebone, or this fishmonger in Cork, who caught this poor beagle shark, and a friend of mine used the meat for his restaurant, and then I got the skin, and we got him to skin him, which he did very brutally. And this whale came onto the shore near my house, and all the scientists rush onto the whale, and they disembowel them and give them autopsies, and it's terribly kind of brutal. And kids even uh, carved graffiti into the, into the skin of the whale. So you have this very strange um, relationship to this dead animal in a way and this kind of strange human claiming and this was um, the shark that we caught down in New Ireland they eat them they catch them to eat it's not it's not uh, it, it is ritualized but it's very much about food oh this was a show in Fritz Street Gallery in London that was uh, actually happened a little bit before Sapiens but it was around the, the same idea and this gannet, this was the first gannet I ever found, and I attached him to a parachute, and it was very, very simply the collision between the human inability to fly and the bird's ability to fly. And what was lovely about the parachute was it was blue. You know, they're used by the army, I think, so that you can't see them on, on good days or something. And then the gannet's nose, beak was just a tiny bit off the bottom of the, the floor. And and this was a li uh, my studio, uh, very sadly, birds fly into the windows, uh, you know, uh, at intervals. And he left a smudge on the window, this thrush. And th the smudge was there for ages. And um, it, it really upset me. And I took a photograph of the smudge and then put it onto, I had it printed on acetate on glass. So that in fact, and called it thrush drawing. Um, so the whole gallery was full of these very, besides the parachute, very small pieces. This is called Family, and I love, I actually love this piece. It's, this was a three dried um, spider crabs that I found in a, in a lobster pot, and um, they were completely desiccated, so a friend of mine made a mould, and we, they were like 15 part moulds. So it's mummy crab, daddy crab, and baby crab, and daddy has a, a big penis on his back, and what's what, what I love about crabs, they're exoskeletal, you know, they're, they're crustaceans, so their skeleton is on the outside and their flesh is on the inside. But the, the kind of absurd notion of making a family uh, out of, of a, a relationship out of these animals that I kind of loved, but also going way back to my early work, where it's about looking at the, the, the penis in some ways as a vulnerable element, because uh, it, I've always felt it is. But in this case, it's like some kind of, you know, canon. But, um, but again, it's, if he's exoskeletal, you know, it's, it's, it's an absurd notion of kind of protective uh, device for daddy. But, um, and this was another one I did with a little Lara's finger the, on, the, on the right hand side. It's actually a little Lara's finger cast in silver attached to a, a crab. And this was, a, my mother was, uh, um, when she got married, her father gave her a present of this travel case. And all, on all, it's all ivory and silver, and it's almond oil, and you know, hair brushes and thimbles and curling tongs. It's extraordinary, and it's made out of crocodile skin. And she, she gave it to me, and I had it lying around for ages. But she was Kinmonth when she was uh, her maiden name, but she became Cross when she got married. And so C is engraved on all these things. So I just put the crab in there. I, I cast the crab and um, uh, silver plated him, so he just sits there. C is for crab as well. Um, and this is a piece that I, again, found on the beach. It was a sheep who unfortunately got her head stuck in a lobster pot. And at the time, I was <laughs> invited to go and do a lecture down in 
St. Petersburg, Florida and Salvador Dali Museum. And it was, uh, I thought, oh God, I don't really like Salvador Dali. But the next day I went for a walk on the beach and I, I found this and I went, this is completely Salvador Dali. So I phoned the man up and I said, I'll do the lecture. <laughs> so we, we pulled the, I pulled the, the lobster pot with the smelly old sheep up onto the rocks and let it decay. Now these are not great slides, but we showed this in, 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 in the show on Frit Street and called it Wrong Deaths. So I waited till the skull was completely dried and then had it silver plated by people in, in England and put the, the skull almost like a reliquary into the lobster pot and just had a line there. And this piece was called Salve, it's not a great slide, but in Goethe's house in Weimar, which is a very beautiful house if you're ever in Germany, you should visit, um, in, in, inlaid into the plank in front, inside his front door is the word Salve, which is this wonderfully kind of strange lettering. It's kind of uneven, it looks like they made mistakes. So I found that piece of wood floating on, in, the, in the water and I got this wonderful man who inlays wood called Ben Russell to in, inlay this black bog oak into this throwaway piece of wood. Because that's the other thing, the relationship between these things that are of no value and uh, that I find very interesting. And sa salve is a salutation. And it, initially they use it kind of as slang, say, how are you? Um, and, but it's also like some kind of um, reclamation of something that is of no value is, is interesting in, uh, in a refocusing in some ways. And, you know, I know I'm, I'm not an academic and I, I, I'm, I'm quite conscious here that I, I should be um, maybe applying that notion of, you know, strangers from the deep, which might make more sense at the end of this thing. But there is something about, you know, familiarity and and that is so corrupting in a way. And maybe, and I think Robin and Richard know me well enough that I, I speak very much, I never write anything down, as you can tell from this lecture. That, um, so, so sometimes it makes sense when it comes out of my mouth, but the, 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 the value of art is its strangeness. And you know, the quote by Baudelaire saying that beauty is always strange is, I think, Fantastic. Um, but art, by, by its nature, should be strange. Um, because if it's familiar, it's in no way going to engage us with anything. But there's this determination to fam make everything familiar in this world that is so frightfully conventional and upsetting. And I. I wonder, is it my aging or is it actually the world that is becoming more and more conventional um, and further and further away from strangeness? And yet, going back to that first image of, you know, uh, the strangeness of our existence, uh, but then, the, you know, the, the lack of strangeness of our behavior and our fear of it, you know, we, we could talk all night about fear around that. And the, the, the title of this whole set of lectures that Richard is doing, hosting the strange er. It's, you know, even that we have to consider that is, is, is really a sad because that's where excitement lies, indifference, and yet we're so removed from that, generally speaking, I think. Anyway, um, this is going back, I'm go going to sh show you just a little run of slides, of slides here of different objects because so the crystallization of an object when it works can be lovely. This is a piece called P Passion Bed, which I knitted all this wire together way back in the 80s, and got 30 glasses that were kind of this kind of urine colored glass and en engraved onto them 30 different species of shark that are known to have attacked man without provocation. And this connects back to the piece we showed in the Gone Show called Slippery Slope. But the notion of passion bed too is that it's spent and the danger of passion, which again is very highly uh, charged with strangeness, um, this is the spent notion of that, so that the, the glass is no longer possible to drink out of because it's hard to see here, but when I sandblasted the, the perfect shapes of the sharks, it burst through the glass, so it's no longer able to hold the liquid. So it's almost like the, um, the, you know, the mattress has been contaminated or blasted away. This was called Kitchen Table, and it had the same 30 species of shark burnt into the surface of the table and a little enamel bowl that your granny might make her brown bread in. And underneath this kind of um, curved structure that had a, a glass um, test tube full of fossilized shark's teeth that I got, um, that actually come from America somewhere in some riverbed. Um, 
This was a kiss, and I, I did a piece called Strangers on a Train, and I cast the kiss between two people's mouths. So when you put in this dental plaster into your mouth and you kissed somebody and you pushed your tongue intensely and your lips to them, you end up with this palate and the hole that occurs is where the lips push the plaster out of the way. So the hole is the point of, of most intense touching and passion. So the loss is the kiss in some sense. Um, this was a little set which was based on the notion of the convention of marriage in a way which is it's, it's, uh, the backs of two cuttlefish bones. It's a very ancient system of casting precious metal. And what I did was um, I got two rings and cast them. To, you impress the ring into the bone of the cuttlefish that you have in budgies cages and everything else. And then you make a little channel and you pour in your molten gold. But this was about the impossibility of wearing those rings. The rings are cast between two animals, but you end up with this little um, abstract thing that is impossible to wear. And this is a beautiful thing I found under the water in Ireland a couple of years ago. I was diving in the, in the fjord up the road and it's an old whiskey bottle that, where these tube worm colonies grew around the bottle. And it's like Botticelli's Venus or something. It, it's just so, I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. My, and I went back down <laughs> with my dive buddy and I put a camera down there and a plate and knives and forks and I tied them into the tube worm colonies hoping that these things would grow. But the storm, one, a diver brought up one of them and then the storm washed them all away. But the, that kind of beautiful relationship between nature and culture and something like that. And this piece was a little, a friend of mine went to, um, up to the Arctic and he said, what would you like as present? And I said, uh, a wal he, I knew he ate walruses, so it was all about subsistence up there. So I said, bring back a whisker of a walrus. So he brought back this whisker and there was kind of the residue of blood and they're very hard things. And this was a thimble belonging to my grandmother. So we just, I just drilled a hole in the thimble and attached the whisker, which is very much about the notion of touch and sensitivity with the walrus and the removal from touch with the thimble. So again, in some ways, it's about fear or removal from our natural touch. A Bible with a hole in it. it this was a Bible that was in the attic. I didn't know what to do with it. Decided to drill a hole in, in it. <laughs> uh, literally, and this is where I rely on my academic friends, you know, or, or analysis. You go to your shrink and you say, why did I drill a hole in that? And they tell you. This is in the days I went to a shrink. But the... Um, it, I, I actually opened it at this page and I showed it to a friend of mine and I said, why did I do this? It was very, very hard to do to begin with, Ver technically very hard. And I did it really well, there were no tears or anything. And I, I opened it at this page and my, my friend James said, but of course, you know, of course you know why you've done this. The, the whole lands of the hearts of the two Marys, these women were in love with Jesus. He, at this point in time, had just gone up into heaven and, and from the tomb when he came, you know. And at that point, uh, his, he, his body becomes spirit and it's a disconnection from body. And what ha in effect has happened here is that the hole or the, the void has landed where the hearts of these two women are. So I have reinvested some physicality into the Bible, but it's through loss also. You, you've lost... Um, the body of, of Jesus and it's become spirit, which is, uh, as a Catholic in Ireland, you, you, you really feel that because you're removed from the body in terms of teaching uh, and told it's bad. So it became this kind of glory hole in the Bible and it didn't actually destroy the Bible. You could still read it. It was not a, a, a vandalism. It was, it was very controlled. And these snakes, again, maligned creatures um, that I got from a scientific supplier in North Carolina. And when I was gutting them, I found their hearts and uh, was struck by that stupidly. And um, they're like little kidney beans. So I st put them into these little silver reliquaries and <coughs> have entwined the snakes as if they were being tenderly in, in love with each other and I called it lover snakes. And then uh, I moved to studios about every five years and this was an old power station I worked in where I started working with cows udders. And um, I was there for about four years. And in the early 90s, I started working with udders. I had seen an, a sieve in northern Norway made out of a cow's udder, a utilitarian object. And I thought it was fantastically surreal and fascinating and wonderful. So I came back to Ireland and accessed udders, skinning the cows upside down. The cows were being skinned for leather. They were old cows. Um, 
but normally speaking the cow is skinned, ripped down the middle and you, the other is destroyed so it had to happen the other way around. This piece was called Amazon, the title implying mystery in some sense but also referring to the Amazonian warriors who were more adept at shooting bows and arrows because they cut off one breast. Um, and it, it was focusing on the nipples, the teats, and at the time I was working on them, I was reading a lot about cows, and one of the articles I read said, the darkest place in the world is the inside of a cow. And <laughs> it, was, it was about milk uh, production or something. It was a very strange kind of approach. But, um, it, it, and the size of others were so terribly, terribly important. But what I was interested in was that, when I saw the sieve in Norway, was that it gave the cow another use. She wasn't only this docile thing being milked, and that somehow that she was being resurrected in the imagination into some other territory. So the Amazon referred to, you know, fashion, the Amazonian warriors, but also she only had one single teat. And when you looked at it close up, it was very like the tip of a penis. So it went into very Freudian territory then and became quite simple and obvious. Um, but very peculiar and, and getting back to the notion of strange and I even felt they were very strange in the beginning and I used to hide them because, uh, because of, of, of fear actually and I remember some of the technicians and I used to work in the old power station they'd come in and I'd kind of cover them in a sheet and uh, because of the feeling that you were um, mutating something unnaturally in a funny way uh, and yet you could do that in a painting with paint or whatever but actually to use the material itself it's much more of a taboo area. Um, in the 50s and 60s, pregnant women were told they should drink more Guinness and that it would make them healthy. So this piece was a Guinness bottle I found in the power station and I just stuck a teat on top of it. But it was also, th that was also about uh, obliteration, you know, the need to drink Guinness to be intoxicated, which is black, and, and then the overlap between the white of the milk. And it was, I thought it was a very, very simple piece and the, and, and the nurture of the nipple. Because these pe pieces are not about denying nurture or, or the milk giving thing. It's about that overlap between two territories. The phallic, therefore, possibly powerful, and the, the nurture of the, of the breast. This piece is called Ladle, and it had one little teat. And Life Boy, where you had two notions of life support, the, the, the nipple and the, and the Life Boy, <coughs> uh, and a pillow. And this piece was the end of the other series, um, where I got a pair of knickers and stitched a <laughs> teat into the gusset. And it was, it was the only piece that was very definitely placing the teeth uh, in the genital area. But I, to try and kind of tone it down, I put it in a, a, in a trunk in, in the show so that you had to go and look into the trunk. And, um, and you weren't too sure whether someone had thrown them away because they were disgusted by them or that they, had, they uh, you know, were leaving them there for future use. <laughs> and it was fantastic the different um, responses like an old aunt of mine spent ages looking and then came up and said well that's life and just walked away you know <laughs> I thought where has she where has she been but um, and then you know a psychoanalyst friend of mine came and went on and on and on about Freud and blah 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 and then this other guy came and said well you can buy things like that in, in New York sex shops that are inverted kind of penises and rubber knickers, which I didn't know about. But um, that was the swan song to the, the cow's teat. I didn't do any more after that. Because it was kind of like you couldn't, I suppose. It was the end. Um, are we doing all right on time? Yeah. Uh, this, this, this is a, a little piece that's very kind of personal in a way. These were neck, little chiffon uh, kerchiefs that my grandmother wore. And I happened to come upon pieces of skull from another aunt who was a pathologist. And I drilled four little holes in the pieces of skull and made buttons and stitched them into the middle of the chiffon scarves using the same color thread and called them skull buttons. Because um, my grandmother is now long dead. And, but, you know, they did use animals' bones for years and years and years for, for buttons and, um, you know, mother of pearl and all the rest of it. Uh, but it was along that line, I suppose, dragging us into that same territory. Um, I, this is a piece that I thought I had to put in because it's about a wonderful woman who lived a very unusual life called Maud de Lapp. She lived on Valencia Island in County Kerry and in 1902 she succeeded in breeding jellyfish um, 
in her father's house. She was not a, trained as a scientist. She was an amateur naturalist. Years later, she got awarded by the Linnaean Society, honoured by them at the end of her life, which was fantastic because um, she had done some, such extraordinary work. But myself and my brother, Tom, who's a zoologist, were funded by the Wellcome Trust to make a film which we call Medusae, which is the Latin for the plural of jellyfish, Medusa, which is a fabulous word. And this is Maud in the middle between her two sisters, Mary and Connie. They were the three daughters left over from a Victorian family uh, who were married off. The sons became ministers or went to war. One or two girls married. And then there were three women who didn't marry, who were left living in a big old house on their own with very little money. But they found a cuvier as well and photographed it on a table in their garden. And weirdly, the one that I showed in the beginning was a Cuvier's whale, and they're quite rare whales. But beautiful, the way they set it up to take the photographs. So myself and my brother decided we'd try and make a film that was, a, and it's, it's an awkward, weird, kind of hybrid little documentary we made that is about half about the memory of Maud and trying to look at the facts we know about her life and not fictionalize her, and half about the swimming techniques of a jellyfish who lives in Australia called Chironex fleckeri, that's the most deadly animal on the planet, and is very prevalent on the east coast of Australia. And if you've been there, you've probably noticed that for six months of the year, you're not allowed to swim, you have to swim in nets. But they're very little spoken about. Um, but Maud, in her life, only ever came to Dublin once, which would have been a, maybe a six-hour trip. But she sent specimens to the Natural History Muse Museum in Dublin, which is this wonderful building, Victorian building. This is her whale skull, after she sent it up from the table. And she also found a turtle and put it live on a train from County Kerry. It's a little one over there on the, on the far side. And the, the letter sent back to her was saying, Dear Mr. Lapp, we thank you very much for the turtle, but unfortunately we had to kill it. <laughs> and that's the turtle there. And these are wonderful. Um, in res this research of that, you do, you know, at, at that time there was a great, you know, there were an awful lot of Victorian ladies who, you know, studied dragonflies and stars and jellyfish and things like this. And a curiosity, because curiosity is another thing that you could make a whole new series of things about. Uh, but these were glass jellyfish made by the Blaschkas in Germany around the same time. Well, a little bit earlier than Maud, I guess. And um, they're extraordinary. Like the technical uh, ability of those men, uh, Rudolf and uh, his son, I can't remember his name, um, are extraordinary. And so then I went down to Palau in Micronesia to film jellyfish because I knew we mightn't get enough footage. And... Um, and we, we got a lot of footage there, and then we came back to Australia, and we had to try and film these jellyfish swimming in a straight line. It was very funny, because very difficult. Um, we did a lot of that technical stuff with my brother, and most of the time, um, they wouldn't behave. Um, and then, actually, Ritesh, I might go on to the next video. This is a video called Jellyfish Lake, which um, Robin referred to, which was a very simple notion. Uh, when I was filming, I'll talk about it maybe in a sec. I'll just show you about a minute of it. Yeah, that's it. That's great, thanks. You, know, you don't have to rush, you know, you can take time. Oh, really? Am I rushing? No, no, don't. I'm just saying if you want to show more than okay. What happened when we were there was, I went with my, a friend of mine from New York who travels a lot with me, and we were both filming. We'd take the camera 15 minutes each. It was paradise. It was, it's an archipelago of islands in Micronesia, Palau, and it's, it, only about 10,000 years ago, these limestone islands were uplifted and kind of trapped these lakes in the middle. Uh, so very recent ecosystems. And um, the only animals that live there are jellyfish and a tiny species of small kind of sprat-like fish. And um, so when we were filming, I noticed what was happening with the jellyfish around my friend. So I asked him to shoot them around my hair. And this was a particular... Uh, thank you, that's great. <coughs> go back to this slide. Um, this is a kind of thing when you're making art where the, sometimes there's a very immediate... Uh, image that you know is it's you have to do nothing to it it's completely there without having to do anything whereas making Medusa with my brother we had to edit we had to look for information this was this kind of poetic 
thing that I had never seen before. Um, the jellyfish didn't sting. It wasn't about some awful masochistic thing. It was about some strange, beautiful kind of lyrical relationship between an animal that normally people run a million miles away from. Maybe instinctively because, you know, jellyfish can kill you, but also through kind of not, uh, not understanding. And they live in a realm that we're not used to being in. And most people, I suppose, don't have access to seeing them in their beauty underwater. And when you're with them underwater, they are so extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, but what happened with that kind of navigation of the jellyfish, it would look like the jellyfish was curious and ar around, around my neck. But um, one problem I always have, and Robin never does it, is talking about anthropo anthropomorphizing. Because uh, I think there's a difference in, in what I'm trying to do in relationship uh, to animal. And I don't think I'm necessarily trying to humanize the animal. Um, it's more about looking at um, uh, the inter interconnectedness, I guess, really. And another branch that came from this was that back home in Ireland, this is a species called um, Chrysora isosceles, which is a compass jellyfish, and they're very common along the coast in the summer. And they give you a tiny sting, not much. <coughs> but uh, my brother was, you know, mentioned that jellyfish is 98% water and 2% animal. And you see them on the beach desiccating. So I tried to take them and put them on linen, uh, these napkins and sheets that belong to my grandmother, and dry them. And you, they go through a kind of disgusting process. Some of them rot. You know, some of them that I found on the beach were full of sand. But essentially what you get is a drawing of the jellyfish or the kind of shroud of Turin of jellyfish. <laughs> And this was one on a sheet, a linen sheet that we lit from the back and took a photograph of. Um, so it was kind of nature drawing itself. Uh, chiasm. Chiasm, this is, a, this is a natural phenomenon, this thing. This is a pool on, out on the Aran Islands on the west coast of Ireland. And I think it's one of the wonders of the world. It's about 100 feet long and 30 feet wide. And the sea comes in underneath and rises up and down. So it's tidal. And there it is in bad weather. It's a really, really miraculous place. It's, a li it's again limestone, and the limestone has subsided and created these perfectly machine-like walls. And I was invited to make a, a piece of work when this art centre was being knocked down and rebuilt. And the man who ran it, Fiek McNeil, who's very kind of inspiring, said, would you like to do a project kind of any oops, anywhere? And so I said, let's try and do something here. And we went out and we filmed the pool from 360 degrees on a, on a crane. And what I was interested in was the kind of geometry of it in a way, its perfect proportions. And I realized that the, the, the proportions are very, very similar to the proportions of these handball alleys, which exist all around Ireland, which are concrete alleys where they play the sport called handball. Now they do it indoors. But in the 50s and, and 60s, it was, there were like 400 of them around Ireland. And it was very, very popular. Now they stand kind of empty, a bit like Saul Lewitt sculptures, uh, you know, full of kind of drunks and things like that. And unfortunately, are getting knocked down one by one. Uh, but they're very beautiful places. So I got permission from the school to use these two alleys. There were two built against two. And um, we painted the floors white. And the, floor, the scale of the floor is very similar to the scale of, of the um, Paul Nabesh, the worm's hole, the pool. Paul Nabesh is Irish for, it literally translated as like the, the hole of the beast. But they, in English, they call it the worm hole, that rectangular pool. So then I, I got two singers, a soprano and a tenor. And I put one in each alley. And we built a kind of a, a, a railing uh, kind of um, scaffolding where people could stand. So that if you were standing on this side, you saw the tenor and heard him more clearly. If you stood on the other side, the, you heard the soprano. And I went off for a couple of months on a residency and listened to about 40 different operas about romantic love and extricated phrases from those in different languages from different operas, in the end from about 10 different operas. And the singers sang them in the different alleys on top of projections of the pool. And I'll show you a little video clip of this in, the, in a moment. But this was very much about... Um, it was about 
relationship and lack of relationship. The, 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 the same videos were mirrored exactly on either side of the wall. So you, the singers were walking on exactly the same thing, just inverted. Um, I, I choreographed the music, but not them in, in a way, in that I tried to work the phrases, both in English, French, German, Russian. In the beginning, they start singing. She starts singing um, Ein schönes war, what a wonderful thing love is, uh, from uh, Ariadne of Naxos. He comes in and sings Donna non vide mai from uh, Manon Lasco. And they're independent of each other and they're not relating to each other. But they're standing on these whirling landscapes of this pool which is surging almost like in, in, in this kind of a passionate way, I guess, in and out of the pool. Then they come to a point where they sing a duet from uh, du um, Romeo and Juliet, where they're saying adieu, 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 set adieu, uh, goodbye, uh, parting is such sweet sorrow, basically. But then they start singing the same fragments of music, more fragmented, and end singing where they began, but the music was on top of itself. So we didn't actually musically mess around with it at all. There was no orchestra, so their, their voices were, were, were singing without any support of all those beautiful orchestral instruments. So they became much more vulnerable. And every night they did it three times. It was about 20 minutes long. So, and I, I told them just to walk as they felt, so we didn't choreograph them. And there was a chance that they might meet, like Pyramus and Thisbe, at one point in the wall during the entire night, but they never, ever did. In the three nights we did it. Um, could you run that, Ritesh, actually? I'll just play, just to show you how the, the sound works. It's chiasm B, it's uh, 5B there. that I, I loved about the, the, the title of that was given to me by someone who understood the word chiasm, uh, which comes from a physiological term, I think, uh, 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 where two lines intersect and what, then what is mirrored on either side of that. And it's used architecturally, there's a museum in, in Finland called Chiasma. Um, but what I loved about it was that notion of architectural connection the natural connection between the pool and the pulsation of the water, and then the connection between the two humans. But th it's all structured, but it never, each time you saw it, and each night you could go and you could watch it three times if you wanted to, and because you only had one perspective each time, every time you saw it was completely different. Also because the singers walked on it differently each time, there was, all, there was never uh, an exact replication of it, which uh, it's something I love about uh, both looking at art and about art itself. It's like how you, how you c consider Mona Lisa today and how you consider it tomorrow. Um, it's, it's completely different. Um, and that is something that's terribly difficult to uh, hold on to, which also gets back to that notion of strangeness, which all ties in completely in terms of relationship, in love and passion because how do you hold that notion of desire? And that Robin is an expert speaking about this piece, you should be speaking about this piece, um, and the, that impossibility. But which in, in, the, in the wormhole, in that pool, the tide comes in every day and, and re, re, um, relates differently to the, the containment of the stone. Equally, we relate differently and 
in relationship to the containment of our, our shells or our bodies. Um, uh, so it's, it's something that uh, the kind of the, um, uh, I don't know, the, that kind of, th that uncertainty, again, I suppose I'm getting back to uncertainty, is something that I've, I find extremely uh, desirable. <laughs> I say that, you know, in terms of art, maybe. <laughs> um, now, what's next? Oh, I, sh I should, probably should have shown you this before I showed you Chiasm. This was a, the, the first video work I ever did, which was called Teacup. And it, um, it's normally shown on a tiny screen, so the teacup is the size of the actual teacup. And I, I borrowed three minutes from a famous film called Man of Arran, which was made on the same Arran Islands in the 30s by an, uh, an Irish-American uh, director called Robert Flaherty, who's, who ma made some wonderful films. And it's a little scene of a little curragh boat, which you saw earlier with the, uh, the gamut under it, in a storm, going round and round and round and crashing. And, and it's, again, in some ways, this is very simple, a bit like Jellyfish Lake, I guess, um, in that you're talking about something that is very civilized and, um, and safe in terms of the teacup, relating to something that is very uncivilized and unsafe. Um, but it's also about a kind of a colonization. And for me, this piece was uh, probably primarily about that, in that it's a, the, the notion of tea and tea drinking being very British. Um, the life on the Aran Islands being very untouched in terms of its isolation when it was invaded by the British. You know, it, it, it existed culturally, really, because there was nothing there for the English to, that, that they needed. But now the... The, the, that life is being undermined again through fear and um, of nature really you know you can't go out in your curragh in case you fall in and drown you can't carry a school bag in case you pull your back and all that kind of desperate um, uh, kind of prohibition of relationship to nature that's occurring uh, but wh wh the, the, the teacup uh, the, the, the politeness too of the teacup in relationship to the wildness is something that I kind of liked about that piece and this, this was a trip that um, I made to Antarctica. This is a, these are stills from a video. I won't show you the, the actual video, but I went down there really on a holiday to um, the Antarctic Peninsula, and I brought a, an underwater <coughs> camera. And I took this footage, and I came back to Ireland, and I just looked at it, and I thought, God, you carry that big, heavy camera, and it's really not very interesting. It's kind of blue, and it's not as good as Discovery Channel. And... Um, so I left it in the, in the can for a long time, and then with the guy I work with, we, I, I said, flip it into black and white and we'll see what it looks like. But then it looked like Ernest Shackleton. So then, no, I said, we can't do that. <laughs> so then I said, let's, uh, this was such a trick, in a, in a funny way, a bit like a trick, a bit like casting the kiss. It was, it's, the casting of the kiss was A, B, C, let's ha how can we cast a kiss? And it, it is about you using kind of tricks. But what happened when we, when we turned it into negative became incredibly beautiful. Because when you're down there, it, it is quite extraordinarily strange to be surrounded by, by icebergs that are nearly as big as high rises in Manhattan. You know, you come in through the fog and these things float past you. Uh, and you're aware it's incredibly um, perilous and melting in front of your eyes. Um, so what happened when you went into the negative and when we went scuba diving? is we were wearing all this black gear and we were against these icebergs. So when you put it into, into, black, into black and white negative, you, you start getting these glowing, almost toxic figures in this landscape that becomes very strangely um, uh, kind of undermined in a way, which is kind of, uh, and perilous, I guess. Um, and this, this happened around the same time. Wh you know, where I live, I find things on the, sh on the shore, and I keep finding these bits of old rubber fins and boots and things. And uh, there was a sound te technician in my studio one day who had webbed toes. So I cast his foot, and I patinated them in... They were cast in bronze and then patinated. Now, that's actually my foot. But what I was interested in terms of discovering these, the residue of the old bits of rubber fins and bits of boots is that, uh, again, getting back to us, you know, our, the, uh, the residue of us, you know, like the, the skull button or the... You don't find a body on the beach, a uh, human body. But actually in the Galapagos, they did, they found this desiccated body on the beach in the very early days of Galapagos. They have photographs of this man all dried up. But what I felt in terms of these pieces is that 
what you get when you cast the foot, um, that's a little boy's foot, um, is it's almost like you've, you've taken your skin off, like you take your fin off, so that the, the foot becomes almost like a shoe. The skin is just a, a closer shoe to your skeletal structure in a way. That's the sound technician's webbed toes, like fantastic. He, he, had, um, he had sandals on, and I saw them. They're completely webbed. But um, this piece then is called Ghost Ship. I'm, Date-wise, I'm jumping all around the place. This was back in 1999, and this was uh, a public project I did in, in the Museum of Modern with in conjunction with the Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, where they asked artists to put in ideas to make a project within the Dublin Bay area that would last for just three weeks. And my father, we used to live by the sea for three months every year, and my father took a photograph of this boat in the 1930s. And I then found the same boat strapped to a quay in Dublin, quite derelict, um, and discovered that it was the same boat that my father had filmed, and our photographs. And my father used to bring us out there when we were kids as a treat, because there were men that lived on these boats. There were light ships that were moored to the, the reefs underwater that couldn't, that couldn't build lighthouses on. So they were basically floating lighthouses. And there were about 27 of them around Ireland, which were decommissioned in the 70s, and in fact, the last one was decommissioned about a month ago. And now they put satellite buoys that have uh, no human beings living on them. So basically, when I found the boat that was in Dublin Bay, it had been given by the commissioners of Irish Lights to these sea scouts. And the sea scout man, I phoned him up and I said, if, if I get this project, will you lend me your ship? And he said yes, um, and, which was very good of him. And they were painted red, and the name of the, the, the rock that they sat over was always painted in giant, big, Barbara Kruger-type letters on the side of the ship. And this particular ship was built in Glasgow in 1928. Fantastic, 128 feet long, beautiful brass lamp up on the top. And about 13 or 14 men lived on them for three weeks on and three weeks off, maintaining the lamp. And um, what we did, basically, was we painted the ship with phosphorus paint to cry, try and create a ghost. And um, uh, it, it was moored in Dublin Bay. And each night we had to build a structure uh, of UV lamps on it because it needed to be pumped up with UV because there wasn't enough sunlight really in Ireland to guarantee that it would glow. So we had this sequence where it would be pumped by light for 15 minutes and then it would glow. And pumped and glow. And, but it was always at its most beautiful at the end of the night when the lights went out and it just went into this absolute fading. Actually, Ritesh, could you run this one? I have a little bit of... Um, now, it's quite... It might be hard to see. It's down, down again. Number eight. Next one. There, yeah. Great. It was at its most beautiful when you were right up next to it, actually. We were told we weren't allowed to sail around it, but we used to always go out at night and, and, and kind of go around it in boats. The camera found it very hard to read the phosphorus. It was um, very tricky to film. But this piece, you know, in some ways, uh, my father's dead a long time. This was um, very much in tune. You know, I felt very much this was a piece. To me, it was a terribly simple idea, a terribly difficult thing to do. We ran into awful bureaucracy, and it almost didn't happen. Um, but it was probably, in, in some respects, the the only piece of work I've ever done that d didn't need any question whatsoever. It, it was about, almost about fantasy, you know, because I think every culture in the world and every person has some notion of, of a ghost ship. So I, I even found that people didn't even need to see it, which is kind of funny. <laughs> you could imagine it, you know.
I think that's it. Yeah, thanks. Getting back to other animals and, uh, and the lover snakes, the only other piece I ever did was a snake, and this is hard to read, but I rented a snake um, and brought it to my studio, and we filmed him coming down a six meter long plastic pipe. And what happened was, you, in the end, we showed the video in a hole in the wall that was only the same diameter as the pipe. And so you had this thing that appeared almost like an eye and took nine minutes to emerge. And eventually, actually what happened when we were filming, he loved being in the middle and he stayed there. We had to poke him out with a stick and put him back in again. <laughs> but he really liked being in the tube. He was a black Russian snake. But in the end, what he does is, you have this thing that, like a pupil of the eye, that moves very, very, very slowly and then emerges and slides out the end of the, of the tube. And uh, I showed it in a way in relationship to this door. So <coughs> that's it over on the far side, where you have this little hole that um, uh, is, is very obscure and strange, almost like some kind of um, you know, plug hole or something. And then the door was just a door I had a, in my flat where I drilled many, many holes. And brings in that thing of, of kind of vulnerability. But it's no longer a protective thing. Uh, but what I loved about uh, the snake that in some ways tied into a piece I made called uh, eye, uh, eye Maker, where a man makes this eyeball, is you had this strange relationship between what m most people considered was an eye that then turns into a snake. Um, I'm throwing in a lot of mixed <laughs> stuff here, but the, wor the work it, it, um, tends to do, uh, do that. Uh, this was a piece called Figure, and... Um, it was a little video piece that I made. We got permission to film outside the Customs House in Dublin, which is a, a, a very lovely building by Gandon. And we filmed it at 5 o'clock in the morning, on a summer's morning, and shut off the traffic and everything. And a friend of mine, I got to dive. There are these, there are these ladders on the edge of these granite walls along the river in Dublin. And for some reason, they're painted white on either side of the ladder. I think it must be for people who fall in accidentally or suicidally, who might want to climb back up again. So it kind of shows them where the ladder is. But um, so that is actually there, that white mark. So I got my brave friend to come and dive from the ladder into the river. Now, the, the customs house is kind of customs and excise, and it, it stands for kind of the institution of kind of uh, accepting or rejecting. So what I was trying to do with this piece which was commissioned very much for the centre of Dublin, was to take a human being and put them in this position in front of this edifice where they dive naked into this river. And what he did was he'd, he'd go in, he'd, he'd come up, and then he'd wait for a moment and he'd climb back up again. And in the video, you, you saw him doing this three or four times, but then the fifth time, the, the camera goes into the splash and you don't actually see him coming out again. So you don't know what he's chosen. Has he chosen between um, the regimen of, of the authority of, of the urban edifice or nature? Has he chosen, you know, obliteration or, or, or some kind of absorption? You know, has he swum off frame? You know, there was nothing certain about it. But also the, the, the strangeness of the naked man kind of doing this kind of, ritual, kind of ritualistic, kind of repetitive action was, was kind of beautiful um, in its own way. I'm coming close to the end here now, but I, I didn't bring anything to show you of the Galapagos work. I made a show in the end called Stage that we, we put in a church where Charles Darwin used to go with his mother until he was eight years old, and it's his bicentenary this year. But when myself and Fiona were in Galapagos, I, I found this room full of bones that was all locked up in the Darwin Research Centre, and um, it's fantastic. It was like, it was, it's just the most beautiful thing in the world. Like, that whale is 40 foot long, and it was like, you know, the most beautiful artwork you could come across anywhere, and it's full of dust. And we went in there every day, and she would read poems. And the film that I made ends with her read, that's her there next to the, the, the whale, um, reading, 
she's fantastically academic and informed about, you know, she can quote from The Tempest, from everything. She's, um, she's worked a lot as a Shakespearean actress. So we ended up with her reading a text by Emily Dickinson about abdication. Uh, and in a sense, I think what we did, we're trying to do with it was talking about a human abdication from the situation of the Galapagos, but also a kind of cultural abdication. Because there's, it, essentially, it, it feels like a crime to, to ev even try to make anything when you're, when you're surrounded by a 300-year-old tortoise's breath, you know? It, 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 just, it, it just silences everything else. Um, and maybe art can only happen in situations that are, un, you know, I'm thinking this more and more, unnatural, uh, which is our heads in one sense, because we're, we're so malinformed or informed, but also the way we live in, in, in the modern world. Um, and the strangeness of the isolation that has occurred through attempting not to be isolated. And all, the, all this, I, I'm finding the modern world more and more, and more confusing, I think. Because, uh, you know, I, I go to the beach and I see this, which is tragic. It's a sperm whale that has landed on the beach. But then you, you see this, where the little girl with the dog. So then the two photographs I show is the whale on its own on the beach and the whale on the beach with the girl and the dog. So the whale exists e despite the fact that the girl and the dog are there. And I'm very interested in that point between the two things uh, of, of presence or absence, but e equally of, um, of uh, the excitement of something and being able to hold on to that. And maybe that's where art is terribly important and the need for new art. It's, it's interesting that music possibly works in a different way. Uh, you can disagree or agree on this one, but you can, it's, so, it's so emotive music that when you hear it again, it, it, it kind of, it, it, it's capillaries or something work in a different way. There's something about um, art, also maybe, maybe it's something to do with the fact that it's made usually by an individual person, that another individual comes and looks at it, they relate to it in a certain way, and then maybe it's not important anymore. <coughs> Um, and that whole thing of collecting and buying and maintaining forever is not important. It's only about that instantaneous uh, moment. Um, this is a, a photograph I took outside my, field, outside my house one night when people drown, which doesn't happen very often, thankfully. Helicopters come and search for them. And I just took this tiny snap, and it was so exquisite in a way, and sinister, but this helicopter was going up and up, down, lighting the sea, searching for what turned out, in this particular case, to be some boy from the, up, up the coast who had had a fight with his father, and he hadn't drowned at all, he'd gone to the pub. And the, 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 <laughs> the, the helicopter was going up and down, spending you know, thousands of pounds looking for the body. But I think this, I, I love these images because, it's hard to see them a bit in this light, they're very black when you see them in real life, they're actually photographs. Um, it is, you know, it's about that thing of expectancy and like if it found something, then it's, it, you're into a whole other territory. But it's about the search in a way, you know. So, and maybe that's what I'm trying to talk about in terms of uh, when you found it, is it over, you know, completely. And um, I think I have two more, this and then I'll show you one video. This was, I was out in, in the wormhole this summer because we were, we were filming to, we made, I worked on an opera in English National Opera called Riders to the Sea. And we used this pool as part of our theatre set for the Colosseum. But I got into the pool and just lay there. And it, it, the scale, it shows you the scale, but it's also for me in some ways epitomises we're all born into this world, and we, 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 we're, we're, con we're all confined in a certain way. What, whatever you are, even if you're an astronaut, you're confined. But that somehow, at the same time as being confined, there's the, 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 the fact of the ocean here, and the strangeness of the ocean, the fact that something can come in from outside, and that it moves in so many different ways, is that despite the containment, the, it, there's m it, it's about multiple possibilities as well, you know? And, and that's, you know, that's enough 
to be uh, excited, I think. So it, it, it is conflict between uh, everything being possible and nothing being possible. It is somewhere between those two ter ter territories. And there's one little video, uh, which thank you very much for doing this. If, I, I'll show you this, it's only a minute long. And it was an accident that happened in my studio and then we showed it in a little room in Darwin's it was, Darwin's mother was a Unitarian, a free thinker, and um, he brought her, uh, she brought him to this little church in Shrewsbury every Sunday until he was eight, and then she died, actually. But it had all these fantastically little polite English rooms, meeting rooms and tea rooms and things. And uh, down again, yeah. Oop. But um, this particular piece, Ossicle, um, we put in a little meeting room on a, on a flat screen, and um, you see now. So that, that's it. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for inviting me here again. You, Boston's very generous to have me back to talk. But th that last piece, in, in some sense, it, 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 I feel it's like a, a kind of a, a kind of a natural metronome. It, it's it's. It's, re it's bringing life into something that's dead, and, and that kind of, uh, that's a kind of a magic relationship into that infinite, fast pattern of sound. And it's, it's kind of totemic, I think, and the, the way it lay in a kind of that crucifixional way, I, in the church, I suppose, where Unitarians aren't crucifixional, but um, it, it, it kind of brought something that is what I'm talking about in terms of potential, in terms of artworks, I think. So that's why I wanted to end on that. Okay. So, let pass on. Thank you all for being here. I think Dorothy will take some questions. If, uh, to catch your breath, it's a lot to look at. This work is really incredible. That final piece is stunning. <laughs> you know, how, how everyone else saw that. It seemed to me not crucifixion at all, but this is wonderful dancing. Figure. It was like a little animated cartoon. The sound of it was also just yeah. sound of the mm -hmm. yeah. So that happens every time you do it, right? Yeah. Questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's more actually a, a comment to Dorothy than a question, but um, I found it very felicitous what you said about sapiens and wisdom. And it tied in, I mean, everything in your, in your presentation into the seminar, but that tied in in a particular way, uh, linguistically, but visually, in that th th I was thinking, as you said it, that sap sapiens and sapiensia has the same root etymology as, as sensing, sapper. And when, when I was first sort of devising the, the concept of the, of the seminar, it was called sensing the stranger, mm -hmm. not hosting, mm -hmm. sensing. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to work through the five and then possibly six senses as a way of encountering the stranger and the stranger in, in manners that very often are not available to purely cognitive wisdom. And that in our culture, our modern culture, and I think you, your work brings this out very strongly, we've lost that connection between um, between sapientia as wisdom um, and understanding, kind of conceptual and mental understanding uh, and cognition, and then this underworld mm -hmm. of the senses, and what you were saying about nature and culture, and your return to the underwater creatures and mammalian mammals and reptiles and, and animals, as well as the subaquatic creatures, I think is a real kind of reminder. I know you're not 
that consciously intending this because you never write anything down. But your work, your art, is actually connecting the two, as I see it, wisdom and sense. It's a very, very bodily, mm. it's a very corporeal way of thinking. Are there other questions? Yeah. I, I was struck by your comment that you think more and more that art is something related to the kind of alienation of modern culture from nature. And I wonder if you could flip that around a little bit, because it does seem to me that what we designate as art obviously is different at different times in human history. But if, um, if I take your, for example, your, um, your, your sense of this man singing his wailing song and feeling at the end of a, um, of a, a, a time of uh, connection with nature through art, which is what song is, what we call art in any case, in which that wasn't a sense of alienation, that in fact his art breaks down at the moment when that alienation intersects that there is a kind of chiasmus um, going on there between a kind of art that is rooted and, and um, doesn't feel alienated and a kind of art that is our modern art that does express that alienation? Or do you think that maybe that sense of alienation that we identify as art is something that human beings, even when they're still largely rooted in nature in a way that we can never be as modern people, nevertheless feel a kind of alienation even within that now <laughs> um, I'm not sure wh what I'm being asked but I'm I'm interested in there, there's probably there, it's about consciousness and unconsciousness and naming things a lot because Selam would not call his song art because he wouldn't know what art he he would need to know what art is um, and maybe that, you see, the trouble I think in, in modern times is that, well, we haven't spoken about money at all, but, you know, there's such, there's such confusion around now because of the market and because of 19 million for a shiny red heart. All that has made, you know, the, 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 the word art is applied to so many things that perhaps some people mightn't think is art really? Um, so uh, oof, I'm I'm not sure. Um, uh, well, 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 my I'm question was really about the, the, the connection you're making between art and alienation. Is that <laughs> Well, you said at the end that you think more and more that mm. art is is related to our not being connected to nature. Yes. And so part of my query is the second part was. Is it possible that that's not just a modern sense, but a sense that goes oh, I see. back in human history, yes. that we project nostalgically a yes. moment when yes. there isn't this? Yes. And yet, and yet, there, there's. I think the difference may perhaps is is uh, the egocentricity of art now, is a massive one, you know. But also, I I mm. think that that the. The remove. I think the fact our removal from our relationship to our, our our body and death is probably a big difference between us and Salem, and the way they live is so close to it, all the time, and yet doesn't make a drama of it. You know, it, it's 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 much more accepted. You know, um, and the respect inherent in the death of the shark. All that is what I feel we are removed from more. Um, and the fact that we don't really ritualize uh, death anymore. And, you know, um, in, in some senses, getting back to the first image, maybe that's why I showed the first image, is because, you know, that piece was made of the fetal skeleton in the brain because it is our first inheritance. We inherit our own death. And modern society is, is very good at just making death the entire time, like going to Iraq and going to Afghanistan and all the rest of it. Um, and, and yet we don't consider, really consider, the, the flesh and blood of it, I think. Just, um, so, and I was saying to Richard last night, you know, n n not really understanding the word entropy very well, you know, is, is there something that, you know, am I obsessed with the entropic 
you know, is my work obsessed with that? But I, I don't think so because it ends with revitalizing something that's dead in the bone. It, it is kind of a reanimation or a revitalization of that by, by this inf infinite vibration. Um, so that could be read as a religious thing in, in its own sense. That little piece could be read as, 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 as a, a religious work. And was uh, shown in Darwin's church. Well, it's shown in Darwin's church, which is Unitarian. They're free mm. thinkers, you know, they're free thinkers. I, 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 I kind of want to challenge your words that are so pessimistic all the time, because your energy is anything but. And you go around globetrotting and discovering all these things and finding absolutely marvelous things that we up. And I think what you kind of working on, maybe a lot of us are working on, is, is that kind of reinvention of some sort of global consciousness. Because these people that we admire and these creatures we admire are extremely broken. They're stuck in a niche somewhere. And they're dying in their niche. And the world is evolving into something we don't quite understand. So we not even begin to. But I think these kind of touching of all these things, from Antarctica to the Pacific to Ireland to wherever, is what the important work of today is. And I think you're right in the middle of it. And I, I think you're right in the middle of it. I think it's an extremely sort of optimistic undertaking, even if it's difficult. So, yeah, just... Well, well, I hope so. I hope it doesn't read it. I, I, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe very often I know when I speak, I, I, I exaggerate to try and kind of uh, lift the sand or something. You're but, you're but having I, a great time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I have a great time too? But um, uh, it, knows, it kind of worries me. The nature of art worries me. Because the art is an animal it's too, in a funny way. So. And it's kind of like, it's... it's it, it's be, it's so it's, it's like if we're talking about extinction, you know. I think art's really on the extinct list as well, isn't it, or the, the danger list? No, no. Why do you think so? Why do you think so? I worry about it. I may, I see. The, it's about excitement, and maybe this <laughs> maybe I'm jaded, old one, but um, <laughs> I. I you know, I, I, and I, when I talk to people where I live, I live now in an area that is not, doesn't have the Guggenheim down the road. And it's um, the confusion around art because of what's happened, I think, essentially in the market. And especially in, 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 in Europe, you know, when I teach a little bit now with students who think it's great that Damien Hirst gets 50 million for um, a skull covered in diamonds. I think it's terribly, terribly confusing. Now, I actually thought his skull worked in the end because he left the teeth in it. I don't know if you noticed that part. I thought it was terribly important that the teeth were human, that they weren't cast silver, uh, because, you know, it actually held the, the human still in it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I hope I'm not sounding pessimistic, but maybe, maybe it does come out of, out of conflict and maybe it's necessary to feel under threat. I'm not sure. But then coming back with Fiona from the, the Galapagos, <coughs> she being an actor, kind of director, and me being an artist, we both went, you know, what are we doing? What are we doing? When you see, um, I had been there 12 years earlier and the, the decimation of the place, you know? Um, and, and do you do it through art? I don't know if you do do, through, do, it, do it through art. What we did in the end in that video, which I, I, it was 20 minutes long, is we se sectioned it off and it begins with a very high resolution sound of the breath of a tortoise right next to his throat, which is very prime, primal. And then it goes into sections of us having these very difficult conversations. It's, it's, and then back into beautiful nature and then back into different conversation. And it's a kind of awful piece of work, really, probably. But it's, um, that's all we could end up we felt like we could do because it couldn't be about celebrating actually you know I'm, I'm just it's curious to me that you keep saying it works or that piece works it's not that one of the distinctions you're making is between art that works and art that sells um uh, no, I, I don't think when it comes to my own work, I, am, I, am I talking about that? Um, no, not necessarily. When I, I think when I'm talking about whether it works or not, I wasn't talking about the other people, other persons. I, in terms of Damien's piece, I just w didn't want to diss Damien there because I think that piece actually did work, <laughs> whereas some of his other pieces I think don't work. 
But that's just a personal opinion. You might all think diff completely differently th about. No, no, but to me, it was interesting that you like. It seems like the thing that you think about is that art has to work. It, 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 it's art if it works. Yes, in in terms of the relationship with the viewer. Yeah, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have brought in the, uh, the the question of money at all, but we have not talked. You know, it's a massive, it's a massive elephant in the room. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm interested in this notion about of working because and 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 how that works with this with the notion of strangeness. Um, so much of of what the viewer gets from the work of art has to do with the element of surprise, and yet so much of the art that seems to work is the familiar. It's the strange made familiar in series so that artists have a signature style and traditionally that's what's worked. In what way does it? It's familiar. no longer strange. Yeah, it's familiar. And it's Joseph familiar. Albers. You, you, it's yeah. almost you've seen one, you've seen them all. That's right. But yet there's something there's something so engaging about it to so many people and yet it's no longer strange. But uh, but that yeah but but I think that's the, the point actually because then it's familiar and familiarity is comfort and b people want comfort more than strangeness so that if somebody if you're being literal about it hosting the stranger and someone comes up t to the door and you know you know has smelly feet or whatever and you don't want them to come into the house you know whatever it is um, that you know that that's the root of it isn't it. Um, and, and the market is all about familiarity. It's all about, you know, have you got your, you know, it's, it's about your shopping list of art, you know, but it's completely about the body shop of art, you know, it's... Well, the hosts, in, in this case, to continue the metaphor, are the collectors. Mm. Um, and the collections, and they want to host the familiar. Oh, it's, or it's the viewer. It's, it's the, the viewer. viewer. It's the viewer. Or the viewer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 But they're not hosting anything. They're not being hosted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. <coughs> <coughs> in terms of money, just buying for money, as opposed to, which I thought was what you were saying, as opposed to buying as art. Well, they're both types, you know, there's not only one type, but, um, but it, it, the, the, the thing about familiarity is, um, who did say familiarity breeds contempt? Was it Oscar Wilde? No. Who, who said that? <laughs> Good <laughs> 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 um, Can we take another, another question? Yeah. You. Um, my comments sort of spin off of, of what you were saying. Um, I was really struck by incorporating that quote of Baudelaire into your artwork. The strangeness of beauty, or the beauty of strangeness. And uh, we've been in this course, Hosting the Stranger, tracing the etymology of the root of both hospitality and hostility. And there's something really striking about the allure of beauty and the almost terror of strangeness. And I think you captured it wonderfully in the work that you've shown us. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wonder if you could speak about about the the alluring uh, quality of of the strange, um, because it's strange and is I mean at times you know very off-putting as some of the imagery was, that there's, there's almost an invitation there um, to speak to the strangeness in us, maybe. Um, so it is an invitation to? To speak to the strangeness in us, that, you know, it, it reminds us that this is strange only because it's unfamiliar. Perhaps there's something about us that's also unfamiliar, but I, I just find that despite the, I mean, my initial reaction to to like a whale corpse is a little off putting first. <laughs> but within this yeah. context, there's also an attraction to it, strangely enough. And I wonder, you were saying that, that it's the strangeness that really makes art. I'm wondering what the attractive element is that draws people back to art despite its strangeness. Despite its strangeness. The other thing is, that's, I suppose, the other thing is that what's completely familiar can be terribly strange. But we think it's familiar because we don't consider it. Uh, does that make sense? 
in a Freud way, yeah. the uncanny. Yeah. The yeah. most familiar is actually the most strange. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Catherine? Yeah. Yeah. Are you academics with the answer story? <laughs> 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 I've spent 10 years trying to work it out. <laughs> you are yeah. Should I? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I love what you said about um, giving some of the things in nature a, a second use, you know, giving it a new use, you know, with the others and the, sort of the whalebone and, and, and sort of little dead things, etc., that you find. But I was also wondering if uh, you had an experience when, in the making of art, you know, that moment when you sort of take something, uh, you know, and give it a new use. That, that's a, that that moment of decision is also kind of an ethically fraught decision perhaps for you? Do you experience it that way? Or yeah. is it, I mean, uh, how do you decide on, you know, what the lines are, what the limits are? Mm -hmm. I'm sort of wondering this, and the reason I'm asking this question is because I'm sort of, um, you know, um, struck by how contemporary art is so much about making art, right, rather than representing. It's, it's sort of, and, and more and more, it's, it's, it's about making, it, making art with, 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 with life itself, with, with, with biological life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, it's, um, I mean, I think about, for instance, an exhibit by, you're probably familiar with the artist whose name I've, uh, I'm, I'm repressing right now, but you know, the, the goldfish uh, blender mm -hmm. exhibit, do you know this one? No. Um, it's very famous, and perhaps someone here can, uh, can sort of, um, can um, you know? Can come up with the name of the artist? Uh, 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 I believe a Danish artist, uh, or was it uh, Austrian? Uh, you go into a, into the into the into the room, and you know, and in, in the museum, and there are these blenders that are you know that are plugged in, and and there's water in, in the blenders, and and there are goldfish, you know, sort of you know circling around, and you can, if you want, press a, the button. Uh, only one person did it. <laughs> right and and the same artist. What is that? He's very well known, and I, you know, I, I'm not for the life of me. I, I just can't remember his name. <laughs> uh, but he had a he had a similar exhibit. I mean, it's sort of a you know the the flip of it was, uh, you know, you could uh, you look through a window and, and you look in, into a room and, you, and there were a ton of rats running around, and if you you if you chose you could you could, you could walk into the room. Mm -hmm. and experience rats jumping upon you and that sort of thing. So you're the goldfish at that point. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, I'm just giving that as an example of the way in which, you know, I mean, and this, and that's just one artist, but there are many of them you know, working with blood from accidents or, but, but you know, putting I human bodies in display, etc. It's so. completely abusive, though. That's completely, you know, I wouldn't, you know, for one second consider that art. Um, okay, I want to know why, and I want to know how you, you know, fish, you yeah. know. Uh, I'm not a vegan and I wear leather shoes and... Everything I use has died, you know, would have died without me having anything to do with it. it um, so, and yet I am quite conscious that I am using them. I was very conscious that I perhaps was using Salam. And I did say to Salam that I hope to try and go back and I haven't managed to do it. Um, because nobody's ever gone back, you know, because it's very easy for me to go down there, film him and show him crying. Um, but he wanted me to take the, his image of crying and, and use it. He did want me to take it. But the, the abuse of it, it's a very fine line of, of how you abuse. Um, but I think what you're doing is wonderful. And that is what art is about. It's but, taking something out of the context of... Yeah, no, I think what's interesting, what you were saying there about making art, you see, uh, or representing. I think one thing I, I rarely do is... I couldn't paint a picture because it would, I, I'd have to create everything out of perception and normally everything I do is taking things and putting them together. They already exist. It kind of doesn't really matter. Uh, it's almost like I have nothing to do with them, I sometimes think. It sounds a really stupid thing to say, but that you place a, a, a cow skin um, on a, a tailor's dummy. It, it's kind of this strange thing that could near... It's, it's, um, it, it's a collision between two elements, uh, and I really haven't ch ch I haven't painted them blue, or I haven't I haven't really denaturalized them or changed them at all. I rarely change things. Um, so it, it's about the quality of the. No, not necessarily. But 
Oh, I think there, there are lots of lines that, uh, that can be crossed, but um, I, th I think in terms of the different types of make making, um, uh, it's about creating. I feel I don't create anything. I think what everything's there already, and it's just about just putting different relationships that make you think in a different way. Um, and I think the world is full of so much stuff in a way that... Um, uh, I hate to think I'm making more stuff, you know what I mean? Um, and a lot of these things have disappeared. It's quite funny. That, uh, it's not funny, but the Amazon, the Taylor's dummy, got lost uh, in a crate somewhere. She's disappeared. A lot of them have disappeared. And it nearly, it kind of doesn't matter, you know? And the boat is gone. The boat is gone, yeah. The lighthouse. But, um, but it, it is, you see, I think this, I think the, the fact that you were upset by the goldfish in the blender is good, you know, because it, it's, it's terrible that somebody puts a goldfish in the blender. I mean, mm. I'm just curious, I want to hear from you. Mm. Well, I just think there's good art and bad art, and I think putting a goldfish in the blender is bad art. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an abomination. But then years ago, I wrote to all these feminists. the name of the artist, Peter Mayer? That sounds... Peter Mayer. What was your name of the... What is the name of the exhibit? What did you put in? Uh, goldfish uh, blender? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Google goldfish blender and you'll get it. He was in, he was in Copenhagen where he was, he was fine for displaying that. He's fine. 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 Yeah, he's, he's really well known, but there, there are several, um, I and mean, there, that's just one example of putting, of using life, and I was yeah, just sort of... Life, I was, I but using Oh yeah, just like I say that, uh, you know, in a way, if I found my, you know, if I was drowned and on the beach and someone found me, that, that, you know, that's what I was playing with, with the feet and the fins in a way that, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that my body is that sacred once I'm dead either. You know, the Madagascans dig you up and wash you. Or you have to be sure of the life and death. Very sure that you know what's alive and what's dead. Oh yeah, what's alive and what's dead. Yeah. Oh yeah, but that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't I don't I think it's easy. Years ago I, I was trying to get people to write about cows for a book when I was doing the others. I was doing them in the early nineties and I wrote to a woman I think who lives in Boston, Mary Daly, is it? Yes. Yes. Uh, is she here? <laughs> what? Mary Daly taught at this university. Did she? Well she wrote me the, the most <laughs> unbelievable letter just saying that I was an abomination. I sent her a picture of the cow. And um Oh my God, it was, um, it, the letter was, I think I have it somewhere in my files. It was amazing. I'm a show, you'd love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, and, but then, you know, most people, a lot of people who, who would, would be wearing leather shoes who come up with those arguments, you know? So I, I'm thrilled if they are. <laughs> I, I had a vegan student once who got really upset and I went into his studio and he had, um, uh, sable brushes, so and and hog hair brushes, so it was fine. I was safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we take maybe one last uh, last question? Yeah. Um, you spoke about your art, sort of uh, illustrating the chiasmus of men and nature, both in the fact that we're viewing nature as art, and that you were in nature creating it, and. Um, I think that was really illustrated by the carcass of the whale and the girl looking at the carcass. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about when you experience that chiasmus making it. Because we're seeing it sort of like filtered through your view of the intersection. But I'm just fascinated as to like how that intersection happened to you. Yeah. It w uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, an interesting uh, question and it's different for every piece of work. But also sometimes it's not appropriate that I'm here talking to you about the work. And also you've seen it in a very bad way. You've seen it in kind of wishy-washy slides and bits and bits, and, you know, it's hard. But a few years ago I decided it, it was important to talk about it because I think um, the, the, the voice of the visual artist is rare, rarely heard. And, you know, we're not, we're not kind of trained in words really. But I think the question that you said is when do I, f s s when do I f have that uh, feeling? And in some of the pieces it's instantaneous, like seeing the jellyfish swimming around. Mind you, I was swimming around with those jellyfish for a few days before I went, bingo, that's beautiful. Um, it, it varies, it varies. Like the, um, it can be years, something can be sitting in the studio for years. 
and, and then I said that they, they, this is going to work. And the, the other works worked incredibly fast. After I found the sieve in Norway, that's where I had the moment, in this funny little folk museum in Norway, a sieve for sifting grain, four teats, little holes drilled, you know, fantastically economical. And I went Merit Oppenheim, and I said, this is amazing. Um, and then it was just a matter of trying to to take the energy of that object and perhaps make more. So for about two years, it was a joy to go into the studio. And because bing, 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 you know, one after the other, they kind of happened. And then they had to end, too, because uh, I w I'm not interested in just making another other thing to, you know, put in another museum um, forever and ever, amen. Because it, it just, I, I think devalues the work if it's just, you know, reproduced. I didn't mind. Well, we hope it, we continue to produce more and more. This has been wonderful to see all this new.